Welcome to Let's Talk, hosted by David B. Plemons, CPA, Inc. Here, we will focus on the struggle, the juggle, and everyday hustle of small business. We will be here weekly talking to small business owners about their everyday struggles. We welcome your questions and comments, so feel free to email us at admin at plemonscpa.com. We hope you enjoy, and above all, we hope it helps. All right, well, welcome. You are joining us on the Hustle, Juggle, and Struggle of Small Business. Hi, I'm Thalia Williams, Marketing Concierge for David B. Plemons, CPA. Today we have on our show a very timely guest, Mr. Vic Malloy. He is a cybersecurity specialist. Welcome, Vic. Good afternoon and welcome and hello to everyone. I'm glad I don't have the two brothers in here because I had two brothers in here and I was like close to Michael and one was right there. Oh, my goodness. Like, oh, my goodness. Oh. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, but we're, we're going to get through this. Really. Yes, we but, are. But it's... I, I think um, what should come out of this crisis and this response is a greater appreciation for, at least in the virtual space, these things that we're seeing physical or even even hyper in a virtual space. Okay. Because we go about our virtual experiences very casually and haphazard. And then when we have a cyber incident, it's like, well, how'd that happen? Well, how was your cyber hygiene? Mm. In other words... Are you reusing the same password over and over again? And it's just like, you know, right now with the, with the outbreak, we're saying, well, wash your hands. And how many times we talk about hand washing, but Correct. how many times do you really practice it? Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing uh, virtually. Mm-hmm. Uh, pe- pe- we go about our lives and, you know, he's on his phone, I'm on my phone, and, and so forth. So we're in that virtual space, but are we practicing proper hygiene that lets us know that we're in a congested and a contested space to where we know that there are bad actors out there. And so when you get a virus on your virtual device or your physical device, now you see the impact here that's you know, it's manifesting here in the health health wise. Undoubtedly. So that's a very good segue yeah. into what you must know about cybersecurity matters during not just tax season, but any season. So let's discuss some of the ways that we can better protect ourselves because we're talking about a virus right now in the in the planet, in essence, right. and how it managed to spread and as quickly as it spreads. Well, viruses in the virtual world do the same thing, don't they? Most definitely. So the World Health Organization has now clarified the COVID-19 as a global pandemic. So if you think about the word pandemic, what is that really talking about? It pan means worldwide demo means people so this is globally imp- impacting the global population so we're in a a virtual space right now by doing a podcast you're on a device listening to this broadcast uh, before you logged into this you had to use your username and password and uh, identity access management in order to get onto your device so I'm looking at a news article here that uh, the average cost to recover from ransomware rockets to over 84000 So you as an independent person, can you take in the impact of an $84,000 loss to your bottom line? No. Okay, so the fact that last year in August there were 22 simultaneous coordinated attacks on municipalities in the state of Texas. Wow. 22. That's a lot. That's a lot. But it didn't rise to the level of panic or a level of, I guess, attention unless you were that city manager or you were that first responder who is now having to not use his personal digital device but now you have to go back to handwriting a ticket Mm -hmm. and then making sure that everything he did virtually is now being done physically. Right. And so let's talk about what a ransomware attack is. So a ransomware attack is basically when you in your day-to-day business have your information systems that are connected and one of your employees inadvertently clicks on an email that says you are the recipient of the Texas lotto. So once they click on that link, that empowers or enables 
the virus to be launched into your computer operating system that shuts it down. Mm. So you'll get a text message or you'll get a phone call that says, if you want your machine to be unlocked from this virus or this control that I've installed on your system, you're going to have to pay me. So that's why they call it ransomware. Mm -hmm. And business, small businesses seem to have an idea that they aren't worth the time of a hacker to do any of that. But in reality, they're more susceptible than the larger companies because they normally don't have a infrastructure or a support system like a larger company would have to be able to protect them. You have your patches and things like that, but that's not quite the same, is it? No, it's not. So unfortunately, there are many stories out there. One that is just at the top of mind for me is a medical doctor in the state of California last year, had been practicing medicine for over 30 years. So had a quite prominent practice, everything, you know, going well, and unfortunately became the victim of ransomware. Mm. Uh, was not able to, after getting the system back up and turning things back around, able to maintain their business. So a 30-year practice, all gone after a ransomware incident. Wow. And it happens day after day, time after time, because we just don't take those preventative steps, and we'll talk about B.C. versus A.D., um, and when we talk about the NIST framework. Okay. So let's segue into that. Let's talk about B.C. versus A.D., or should we talk about a battle plan? Okay, we can we can talk about, talk about the battle plan. Yeah. So the battle plan is based upon the NIST framework, mm-hmm. National Institute of Science of Standards and Technology. Okay. okay, so that is the government's framework that was established to help help identify how we can respond and prevent the catastrophic effects from cyber incidents. So your battle plan is basically five key areas. Identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. So there are two types of people in the world today, those who have been attacked and those who will be attacked or fall victim uh, to an attack. So in the information technology space, we have what is called a compromise. So we have to be very careful when we say that there's an incident because once you say you have an incident, um, then the lawyers come in and the post analysis of, of your operation gets, comes under scrutiny. Mm-hmm. So the proper term is indication of compromise. So I say before indication of compromise, BC, there are things that you can do to identify and protect your infra- infrastructure. So in your battle plan, you can start with that. So that AD, after detection, mm-hmm. you can then respond, and recover. Because as I stated, there are two kinds of people. Correct. People who have been attacked and people who will be attacked. So it's not a, an, an, a matter of, well, I ain't, I ain't never been you know, a, a, a victim. Well, I've been a victim. Mm. So my Yahoo account was compromised three years ago. Okay. And uh, once that happened, Yahoo notified me and said, you know, your account has been compromised. Uh, we recommend you go in and reset your password. So I was like, hmm, I'll go ahead and do that, but maybe I need to do something else even more, okay. which is called two-factor authentication. Mm-hmm. So I had to go in, so no longer just trusting my username and password, I had to apply a protective measure after the fact, AD, mm-hmm. after the detection, to uh, raise my level of uh, protection and my posture Okay. so that my email account would not be compromised. So talk about two-factor authentication. It sounds complicated, but it must not be because I'm noticing a lot of virtual companies as well as platforms are offering that option. They don't make it mandatory. They give it as an option. So talk about that for us. Yeah, so basically when you hear about breaches and you've heard about Target, you've heard about 
Equifax, OMB, and so forth. It is a result of a user who's either compromised their username and their password and a cyber actor, a bad cyber actor, um, has then used that to gain unauthorized access to that information system. So then that's called a breach. Correct. All right. So when that happens, um, then they're inside and they have free reign. They can create new accounts. They can exfil inf- information. They can destroy information. They just have free reign. Mm-hmm. And God forbid that they have a privileged user's account because then they have the keys to the kingdom. And right. And really, you know, really taken down. So two-factor authentication is the additional level to allow you to authenticate or grant proper auth- authorization into a network. So you would put your username in, you put a password in, and then the authentication system will then send you a text message or a phone call or another form of communication to valid- validate that you are indeed trying to gain access uh, to your account. And mm-hmm. that could be an email account, business account, whatever, whatever software platform that you have that requires your authentication to get in. I think the challenge is, you know, we're in a microwave society and we want quick access. Why do I have to do all of that? Like you say, it's two people in the world, those who have been attacked, those who are basically sitting ducks waiting to be attacked. Exactly. And it's only a matter of time, only a matter of time and the challenge for us, and even during this particular stressful time, right. we're kind of waking up and seeing some things, and we've underestimated quite a bit. Right. You know, and now the challenge is how can I protect myself even more? I mean, most of the planet is on lockdown. Right. Somewhere, somehow, they're at home, they're uh, sheltered in, so to speak. Now's the ideal time to listen to a podcast of this magnitude right. to look at what you have done. And what can be done to better protect yourself? Because we know all the broadband waves are being flooded now with people, and hackers are going <laughs> target rich, target rich environment. Yes, right. and all they need to be is right one time. Mm. You have to be right every time. Mm-hmm. And so, while it may be an inconvenience to take that additional step to authenticate into a network or to look at that text message before you respond. Um, it is very critical that you take it seriously because the consequences could be dire. True, very true. And for those who have been victims of scams, identity theft, they can attest to that fact. Most definitely. And the challenge for them normally is getting their lives back. Right. But if you were proactive versus reactive, you could have mitigated some of that. Not to say it wouldn't have happened, but it's like the layers of an onion. It may have only hit the outer layer. It wouldn't necessarily get to the core. Exactly, exactly. So so that's why I talk about, you know, B.C. and A.D. So what I'm looking at on the screen here is it's an email, and the title of the email is, because we're in tax season, file your taxes free Mm -hmm. with a certain company. And then you think it's a trusted company because it's a nationally known company. It's in your inbox. You're in the middle of all of this lockdown and everyone is in mayhem mode. So you click on that email. Mm. Well, it is a fraudulent scam email. It is not legitimate, but because of it is tax season and you're susceptible to wanting to do the right thing, which is file your taxes, this shows up in your inbox. You say, oh, I didn't do it yet, and I haven't done my extension, and it's free. Keyword. Free. Free. Right. So Mm -hmm. everything is free ain't free. True, because there's (laughs) a price to pay. There is a price to pay. Undoubtedly. And I think the challenge is because it came in the inbox. Right. Not your spam folder, because not a lot of people check their spam folder. Right. Unless they're looking for something, and the filters that the mail providers use is never consistent. Right. Because you can get one from someone in your inbox that you email to, you respond, and they respond, and it goes right into spam. Right. So it's almost like caught in that spider web. It's, of, even, it's even more insidious than that. So mm-hmm. in this age of uh, information technology, we talk about machine learning. Mm-hmm. We talk about artificial intelligence. So you're thinking that, well, this is a tool and a resource only for the learned. No, 
you got a lot of bad actors out there today that are now using machine learning and artificial intelligence, and then just they got idle time. Mm -hmm. They will log into your email account and have access, unfettered access, for a year. Wow. And take no action and just monitor how you respond to specific emails and who it's coming from. So let's talk about the other um, item that just hit the, the news wave right before all the pandemic. Who's watched Shark Tank? I have. You've watched Shark Tank? Yes. Do you know Miss Corcoran? Yes, Barbara. Barbara. Mm-hmm. She got she hit. Would, she got hit by what we call business email compromise. Wow. So someone obviously had access to her email account and knew that she was working with one of her staff members. So her staff member was then impersonated by someone who had unauthorized access to her email account, sent her an email, said, I want you to wire this money. So Barbara being the entrepreneur that she is, got to jump on this wire transaction, sent over $400,000 in a wire transaction. She had a gut feeling that maybe this wasn't right. So after she hit the button, she called the person who she believed was sending the email. And that person said, no, Barbara, I did not send you that email. Mm. But I saw your name on the email. Mm -hmm. Yep. Too late. Too late. Too late. Too late. And... The only benefit, because I read the article, and eventually she recovered yes. her money, but she had to fight very much so. And fortunately, it was going through a German bank, correct, which helped quite a bit because they exactly. were able to stop it. Right. But it was just a mere fact. She did have presence of mind. To make that phone call. Precisely. Other people, on the other hand, would be freaking out, literally. Right. I just lost how much? They don't care if it's $1,000. Right. If it impacts your bottom line in any way because it's unexpected, right. you're, oh, my God, what do I do? And right. that's what they're preying on. Exactly. But once again, you know, as a small business owner, you're making that great taco. You're making that great enchilada. As you can tell, I'm just a Mexican food aficionado. But uh, you got the tamales at Christmas, and you want to put your order in so you – you create your online website, and then someone takes advantage of you. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's the unfortunate thing that you don't take into mind um, as you're a business owner is, have I protected my infrastructure from virtual uh, dangers and so forth? True enough. And those patches that Microsoft so graciously gives, right? <laughs> how valid or how consistent are they? So there is a, um, a well-known term in the industry called Patch Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So every Tuesday, Microsoft does a major release of fixes or software updates that they have applied to their software. Um, other companies do it. I don't think it's that, that frequent, but Microsoft is very committed, just know that, mm -hmm. to countering any kind of vulnerabilities that are known or discovered in their software. So then therefore you as the end user, as that small business owner needs to make sure that you run those updates because when you don't run the updates, the bad guy is counting on you to make sure that vulnerability is there. Mm -hmm. And all they have to do is be halfway around the world or down the street or in your front front yard, gaining unaccess to your wired or wired uh, Wi-Fi access point and check status of updates. And if you haven't updated in a week or so, they're going to say, okay, well, these are the vulnerabilities that are there. These are my back doors, so to speak. I own you. Wow. So talk about a little bit about those antivirus protection platforms or companies. You know, a lot of people know about Norton right. or know about McAfee. and. Right. Almost every computer that you purchase now, be it a business or personal, has a trial run on them. They give it to you for free just to see if you like it, whatever, whatever. But talk about the significance of those particular type of programs. So those programs are great. And um, I encourage everyone, if you don't have a solution in place to protect yourself, make that investment. Yes, free free is good, but free isn't always free. Mm -hmm. um, know that 
bad guys are impersonating antivirus companies and they will send you something that you think is from them and it's really not them. So if you've got to make that investment to protect yourself, it's what, 14 bucks a month maybe, uh, make, that, make that investment to do that. But go with a trusted, known uh, provider and realize this one fact that I don't think most people understand. When you get an antivirus protection put on your device, it is based upon a signature. The signature is created for every known vulnerability that has been mitigated or fixed patch repaired that has been released. If there has not been a signature created, then that's what we call a zero day. So in other words, it's a vulnerability that's in the wild or in the operating system, in the application that can be exploited. And once that vulnerability is there and there's the will or the intent to exploit it, then that's when you become susceptible to uh, attacks. Wow. The challenge, I think, is putting that in perspective of what we're dealing with right now. Right. Because if your immune system is compromised because you don't have enough nutrients, you don't get enough rest, you're around people, that virus has the ability to settle in the host. Right. So it's the same way with our computer systems, with our business structure, infrastructure. So the challenge now, I think, is how do we assess where we are right now? What are some of the things that we can do to assess where we are right now? So let's go back to the uh, NIST framework, 800-553, the framework. There are five elements, as we talked about before, identify, protect, and I call that the BC stage. So in identify, what you want to do is make sure that you take an inventory of all the assets and items that you have. So much like you would do physically, okay, um, let's see, I, I, you know, bathe, you know, and I I know who I'm in contact with or I know about my physical persona. So take inventory of, you know, what you got on your person and and who you are. So it's the same thing with your information systems. Do a scan on your home Wi-Fi network and identify how many devices that you have connected. In my home alone, I have 30 plus devices connected. Oh my goodness. And you're going to say, Vic, there is no way that I have 30 (laughs) devices connected. Think about your television. Think about your television. So, so let's say you have three televisions. I have more than that, but Mm -hmm. let's say you have three televisions. Uh, Your kids are on their gaming systems. People don't even think that while their children are gaming, that that's an access point. It is an access point. So let's take my wife. You know, we had a business conversation, and we talked about uh, upgrading the home. Well, she put the thermos con- thermostat control on the Wi-Fi network. Oh, wow. So now that we could get a discount from our um, electric provider. So that's on the network. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we knew who was coming to the house before they ran the doorbell, so we got a ring system mm-hmm. installed. That's connected to the network. Then we have a Wi-Fi extender so that we can have good coverage in the house. Uh, The next thing we found out is that we have um, smart watches connected to the network. Wow. Uh, We have our um, streaming service connected to the network. So when you add up all these items, these are all surface platforms or or attack surfaces that can be taken advantage of. Would Alexa... Oh, I, I don't have Alexa in my home. But is that an access point too? Alexa in Alexa is very interesting. Okay. Um, they've done studies and reports that says that Alexa has um, sent un, sent entire transcripts from private conversations to an entire distribution list based upon you didn't lock down your Alexa device. That's always listening. Always listening. Always listening. And to make matters worse, uh, there are researchers who know about bad guys Mm -hmm. who have programmed software skills that turns the one-minute timeout off so that by default, your Alexa remains on listening at all times. Really? So if you haven't updated your Alexa... (laughs) 
you need to run a security update wow. and then go in and make sure that your privacy settings are locked down and that you don't allow permissions of your Alexa platform to then transmit without your willing or permission uh, acknowledgement. Correct. So that has to go through a process before just transmitting anything out, out of your home. That's scary. Oh, yeah. It really is. So and that's why I don't have Alexa. I can understand why. Yeah. Well, considering your background, too, right. you kind of know those things. Right. The challenge, I think, for most Americans right. is they love comfort and convenience. Comfort and convenience comes for the price. Doesn't it, though? Freedom ain't free. No. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. So what else can we do? What else can we do? I see you have that identify. Identify. And then um, my screen went. Protect. Protect. So access control and awareness and training. So I would say the number one free thing you can always do is is conduct training. Uh, the, the Small Business Administration has some great free resources that will be um, available if you want to know. Uh, the web address is https forward slash www dot sba dot gov and there's free courses available that will help you educate your employees as well as yourself on measures that you can take to protect your access point uh your your just your day-to-day activities and your your hygiene we're hearing a lot about you know washing the physical phone today well while you're washing the physical phone when's the last time you did a software update on your phone Probably haven't done that, have you? I live with my updates. Every time okay. that thing pops up, there I give go. it about maybe seven days because okay. I know every now and then there's a bug. Right. But with my Apple phone, usually right. a week after I get that pop up, right. I let all the first responders, you all figure the bugs out. Right. Let Apple figure it out. Right. Once they clean it up, then I'll update. Right. So usually I'm updating. And when I teach my elders, my seniors, right. I tell them, let's look at it. See when's the last time you update. Right. And the challenge becomes a lot of times with the seniors is that they have the older phones right. that can't take the most recent update because it doesn't have the capacity. Right. Or or it's just not sust- or not even supportable anymore. Correct. Or they have uh, obsolete software. Correct. So um, I'm not sure if you've seen the movie Fast and Furious. Not the recent one. Not the recent one. No. So there was the one. There was the one episode where Ludacris goes up to a um, an ATM machine, mm-hmm. and he does a couple of keystrokes, and then the machine starts spitting out money. Mm. Well, here's the vulnerability or the, the so what behind it. That bank was still using the Windows XP infrastructure. Oh, my gosh. And true enough, in 2019, there are still financial institutions that are on the Windows XP operating system. Get a clue, people. Get a clue. Get a clue. Yeah. So so basically, they, they call it jackpotting. Mm. And so it's a, a known vulnerability within the Windows XP for financial institutions that have it, uh, that it can be exploited and they can exfiltrate money, you know, at, at, at nauseum. Oh, yeah. That's scary. Yes. Very scary. So what else can we do? So you can, um, so we talked about training and awareness, maintenance, pro, um, pro, protective technology, mm-hmm. um, making sure that you uh, use a um, PIN Mm-hmm. A, per, a personal identifiable number to lock your device. And then even more secure than that is to use biometrics. So the phones are now uh, at a, such a level today that you can use your face as a means to lock and unlock your phone. You can use your voice mm-hmm. to unlock or, or lock your phone or even your fingerprint. Mm-hmm. So there are things that are unique to you that makes you you that you can then uh, tie to your physical device and enable and make sure that you secure your physical uh, devices. Okay. All and right. if you're in business, uh, it's important that you segment your business operations. So what do I mean by segment your business operations? What that means is if you've got workers that are teenagers and they are on social media on the same platform that you're doing your personal, your, your professional business, Mm -hmm. you're opening yourself wide open to those social media attacks that comes in on that platform that now have gained unauthorized access to your business data and your client data 
and all of your other information. So you need to set a policy in place that, hey, look, you can have social media, but you're not going to use the company's equipment or you're not going to, you know, you know, expose the business to a risk by bringing in that unprotected information gotcha. or that access point. Wow. There's a lot to it. So, oh, yes. What are our opportunities for future improvement? Because, you know, you talked about that framework and right. we have your identification we have your protection, which is before right. the indication of compromise. Right. Your but BC. if you, yes, the BC. Right. Now it's AD, after right. detection. What are some of the things that we can think about? So let's say with your detection process, in a large, in a large number of cases, what happens, you walk in and you have no access. So if you have no uh, paid service, managed service, that's telling you that, We've seen this at other institutions or in the wild and you're susceptible and you've increased your layer, then the attack will come. Mm-hmm. And when the attack comes, then now you have to respond and recover. So the way you need to respond and recover is have everything on backup. So it's important that you back up all your critical information, yes, in the cloud, and just you know to clear up what the cloud is. The cloud is someone else's infrastructure mm-hmm. that they maintain that you have access via the web. So that's what the cloud is versus on-prem, on-premises. In other words, in your own business, you go out and you buy a hard disk and you back up your information, your critical information on that device, and then therefore you have full control to it. So I would recommend you always have your physical access because then if your host becomes compromised, your personal devices become compromised, you can always plug in that external hard uh, hard copy mm-hmm. and uh, and then get back up to business operating system and then not become victim to a ransomware attack unless the attack is on your storage device. Which could possibly which be. Which could possibly be. Because you're exactly. backing up everything. Because you're backing up everything. And that bit of code, that bit of a virus. Is still there. Is still there. Right. Which in itself creates another issue. Another issue. Because you've backed it up, but now you're using it again, and all you did was possibly re-corrupt exactly. what's already been cleaned up. Exactly. Mm. Right. right. Mm. So respond. How so AD, you? yeah, so AD is uh, is important. I would say the first thing is uh, how do you communicate? Mm-hmm. Depending on the size of your business, uh, before you put anything out um, authoritatively in a communication Consult with your lawyer Mm -hmm. to say we have indication of an incident or a a compromise, Mm -hmm. and uh, we'd like you to help us with crafting and protecting the information until the entire uh, forensics analysis is completed. Um, So there are businesses that will do a data forensic study to let you know how the the compromise happened and what you could have done to better protect yourself. Okay. So before you communicate anything, get with a lawyer Mm -hmm. and then get with a marketing firm that will help you communicate that properly. Not that you're trying to hide anything, but too often a business owner will say, hey, we got breach. Well, it wasn't a breach. You you probably, you know, didn't back up something properly. Mm -hmm. Nothing was exfiltrated. You know, nothing was lost, but you've gone out there ahead of the actual forensics to tell you what actually happened and you use language that harms your brand, harms reputation, then you got to go back and backtrack. Right, and it sets off panic for oh, every right. one of your Un- clients. Un- yeah, undo, undo panic. Right. So, so make sure you get the analysis, and that's, what, and that's what Respond is all about. You know, have the communications, and then put mitigation in place so that you can mitigate that from happening again. In other words, learning f- from that. And then look at improvements mm-hmm. because with every detection – that's another way that you can improve on how you uh, move forward. True enough. So then once we manage to do all of that, recovery is obviously key. You know, you talked about having that actual hard drive backup as well as in the cloud. But what else can you do to recover? So recovery planning is basically resetting and looking at improvements that you need to make based upon the of the compromise and when it happened. Uh, and then communicating how you're going to move forward to learn from the recent event. Just because you have an event doesn't mean you're a bad person or you're, you're just irresponsible, mm-hmm. but it's important to learn from those things and then apply it and then improve and then share with others 
because that's that's the importance of um, being in this digital world that we're in today. There are information sharing councils uh, that are proliferating. There's the FSISAC, which is for financial services, that they share their lessons and their observations that happen after uh, being in an, an incident or before an incident happens. So they come together and say, let's share between our financial institutions how we can, you know, so protect ourselves. Some of those we, are best practices, yeah, too. Yeah, best yes. practices, right. And so even in the services industry, mm-hmm. you know, they should look to way to share, and it's called an ISAL, and ISAL also helps uh, with uh, sharing information. That's an information sharing um, um, association. Okay. It's less formal than an ISAC, but there there's a way for you to come together. And your Chamber of Commerce may have that available for you, Um you can talk to them about their security councils. Do they have one in place? And if they don't, put one in place <laughs> and, and make sure that, you know, we are sharing and learning from these opportunities. True enough. We're at unprecedented times yes. right now. I mean, this is 2020. 2020. We're early 2020. It's just right. March. But the difficulty is now navigating this pandemic right. that has literally shut down the planet. Now that a lot of people are working from home. Right. A lot of companies don't necessarily have the control that they once had because when you're on premise, you're on their network. Right. Now you're accessing their network right. from home. Right. Which can be quite challenging. Right. Can you give any advice to that business owner who's now in the situation where they have to sure. send their employees home? So for businesses that have not established a um, a telework program and policy. Uh, they should get with their information technology team, uh, get with their business team and their education and training team. And if that's just one person, those are the hats that you're going to have to put on to think through the process of, you know, do we have the infrastructure in place to create a virtual private network or a VPN? Do we have that technology? If we have that technology, have we fully implemented and rolled it out in a way that can be trusted so that our employees know the proper way to authenticate into the virtual private network, Mm -hmm. into the VPN, so that they have access to the safe operating environment. Mm -hmm. Once they've done that, have you given them additional training to say, okay, now you're outside of the physical confines of our corporate operating. Your home is now an extension of that. Have you secured your home environment? Vis-a-vis Alexa. <laughs> now you see why I don't have Alexa. Yes, Because she's exactly. always listening. And, always and, listening. And, and I love Jeff Bezos and, and the technology, but we have to make sure that we exercise due diligence Correct. and secure your environment mm-hmm. and make sure that you're aware of what's going on around you. A uh, lesson that I learned, I was in a business meeting about two years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, my watch went off and said I didn't quite get that. Oh, it was a smartwatch. Oh my! So from that day forward, I now wear a oh. non-technical <laughs> device because I don't need my device listening to me while I'm having. True enough. You can figure out your heartbeat by putting your fingers on right. your pulse. So and there we go. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go low. I'll go low tech. Right. <laughs> High touch, low tech. That's scary. Exactly. You so, know, yeah. because you take those things for granted because of the ease of use. Right. Not realizing on the back end what they're actually doing, right? you know, and it's scary to hear because I have a, a, my son-in-law, Evan, right. he is a IT person too. Right. He refuses to get Alexa, not bashing Alexa for those who need right. it, right. but they need to understand what comes along with that convenience. Right. Okay. Amazing. Any other advice you can give our small business owners or our just business owners, period, that they can start putting in place to help assist them navigate right. these uncharted waters? Well, the government, you know, like I said, I'm not, you know, anti-government, pro-government, but use what's there. Mm-hmm. Department of Homeland Security has a site called Stop, Think, Connect at hq.dhs.gov. Mm-hmm. Once again, that's Stop think connect at hq.dhs.gov. So stop, think, connect is a great resource with a lot of free material, learning aids, uh, presentations that will take you step by step 
as to how do you secure and, and educate the population that you're working with on their responsibilities that they can do. So much like we're talking about the washing of the hands and social distancing, uh, there's a lot of practical things about, you know, you, you being that first line of defense and not being susceptible to social engineering. So social engineering is those relationships that you have and people who are trying to become friends with you who will use form, Mm -hmm. which is family, occupation, recreation, and message, or what is your business. And they will, they will socially engineer you much like spy tradecraft to find out more about you in order to gain access to your network mm-hmm. in your business. Right. So be, be wary of that. Yeah. And that when you have casual conversations, you know, where is this going? Mm-hmm. And do I really need to, you know, think about that? So Stephen Covey has a new book called about the speed of trust. So it's important that we, you know, like I said, readers or leaders, Read books like that. Mm -hmm. While it may not be talking about information technology, it's closely related to what you do on your day-to-day personal interactions. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much. So tell us, how can we get in contact with you to glean even more from what you have to offer? Sure. So, and yes, I realize I'm giving up my personal phone number, but hey, if you're going to be in business, you've got to be there. So it's 210-279-1357. Text me first. And let me know who you are, and uh, and then we can have uh, a meaningful conversation after that. Or you can just send an email to victormalloy63 at gmail.com. Great. Well, thank you so much, Victor, for coming in today. We appreciate all the information you've given us. Hopefully we'll take it to heart yes. and implement some security measures in these unpre- unprecedented days and times. Unprecedented times. So stay cyber aware, stay hand safe, uh, hashtag no handshake, and, uh, and we'll get through this. Definitely. We will get through this. Definitely. Thank you so much. My pleasure. For more information about any of our guests, or if you have questions and comments, please email us at admin at plemonscpa.com. And don't forget to check out our website, plemonscpa.com, for upcoming events and workshops in San Antonio. David B. Plemons CPA, Inc. is providing this podcast as a public service, but it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of David B. Plemons CPA, Inc. policy. Reference to any specific product or entity does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by David B. Plemons CPA, Inc. The views expressed by guests are their own, and their appearance on the Hustle, Juggle, and Struggle of Small Business podcast does not imply an endorsement of them or their concepts or any entity they represent. Views and opinions expressed by David B. Plemons CPA, Inc. employees are those of the employees and do not necessarily reflect the views of David B. Plemons CPA, Inc. or any of its officials. You should always consult your own investment advisors, attorneys, and accountants before making any decisions concerning your financial matters. If you have any questions about this disclaimer, please contact our office.